<laughs> All right. Let me do a pano because that's so cool. Surprised none of you like tried to run. <laughs> All right. So, got to How much time do I have, Patrick? No. It's like when people start passing out in the back. Okay. So, so I'll try to make it quick because all of us, or half of us at least, have major problems with ADHD. So, which is just like me. I'm, I'm good. So I want to talk about how to win the internet and some practical ways. I am an engineer myself and I kind of stumbled upon branding and blogging, if you will, as an accident but it has grossly accelerated my career. And so even as a still a very young person, I have accomplished a lot. And it all has been directed back to the messaging that I've created around my person and the work that I've done. And so it's interesting to meet incredibly talented people, but they've been unable to communicate that in a way that affords them opportunities that really matter. Does that make sense? A lot of times you're you're stopped at the gate because you just, no one knows who you are and stuff like that. So I've been lucky enough, really it is luck, to stumble through some of this. And hopefully I can give you some of those tips so that you can become more successful as an engineer, software developer, and perhaps even entrepreneur. You know how to even spell that, which I don't. So, so, so some stats. I've made a living off of software engineering. I love it. I've been developing software for 17 years. I started as a 15-year-old for a Dow 30 company, uh, Johnson Johnson. I wasn't even allowed to really. I think I, there was an intern, but I was building their enterprise applications and their marketing sites for uh, their global push into Japan, which is really cool. Remember those AccuView colored contacts? Remember those, that, that was the hot shit back in the mid-90s? That was me. I was making those interactive websites, so that was awesome. Flash, man. EMCA script. What? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. I'm married nine years. I've had six ventures, five exits. I have two master's degrees. I have two girls. I don't even know what that one is. But I think I have infinite failures, tons of failures, um, and tons more opportunity. I'm an angel investor. I have 39 portfolio companies. So if you need money, I have some. <laughs> this is my most important startup. It's my wife and my two girls. Um, who has family here? Have you ever had to endure that like day-long photo sheet? And this is like an hour eight, where you're like, I want to absolutely kill myself, but ends up becoming like the best one. It, that's kind of like a metaphor for life, isn't it? Where you're at your wit's end, and then everything comes in the clear. So anyway, I love, it's my favorite picture of all time. Three-year-old insane, she just broke her leg. and. <laughs> The seven-year-old is a princess. These are some of the companies I've worked for. Um, the CIA was really fucked up. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yeah. But I was an executive at um, Fox News Corp when I was 25. I have no idea what the hell they were thinking. But that was really fun um, for a while. But I really got my start as an entrepreneur in 2007. My mom clipped this piece of paper, of course, and sent it to me. She's like, you're on the cover of Austin American Statesman. I was like, oh. Don't embarrass me, I'm at work. Uh, so she clipped that, and that was my first major venture um, as a kind of an entrepreneur. Now I lead the Iron Yard, which is an intensive code school, and I am hiring also Rubyists. Um, so, but these Rubyists not only have to be in love with their craft, but have to be in love with teaching other people. So if you're interested, I pay really well. I give almost four months of paid vacation. Um, so if that sounds badass, you should talk to me. Um, we teach JavaScript, Objective-C, and Ruby on Rails. Theironyard.com. And Laura is our community manager. She's also a Rails girl, and she's a Rails person. So you can talk to her as well. She's awesome. And her husband is awesome, too. And he's somewhere. <laughs> Andy. There he is. Oh, yeah. GitHuber. Uh, I also have a venture-funded iOS app in the store called Pressgram. Um, so I love both open source and proprietary software. So I still hack at night. I love that. And I'm building a desktop application for OS X. Um, 
and that's coming out in July. Um, so that's going to be fun. And that's very much related to digital publishing. I'm just completely obsessed. I'm a Georgia Tech grad. Um, really lucky. I failed my way through. Uh, I started with CS, but I failed out my freshman year. I was a douche, like total ass. Um, but they let me back in. I conned my way back in, and I've got two graduate degrees here, one in education. All right, so after that, so who cares about personal branding? What we're going to start is with personal branding as kind of a meta level why, why this is important, why you should care. And then I'll walk you through some practical things to encourage you to actually execute against that why. I love memes, so I forgive me in advance. <laughs> and just my wife, she thinks that's all I speak in emoticons and memes. Um, but after nine years, it's kind of like telepathy anyway. All right, so why does this matter? Because I said so. It's about competition, really. It's about being competitive. Why personal branding matters is because it lets you be more competitive as an individual. As much as we love community, as much as you guys are peers, and you know this is a community here, you are competing for jobs. And what's nice about being a software, the software world is it's a big ocean. So in, in most cases, all of us are going to be well employed for the rest of our lives. I love this industry. I can't imagine being in any other one. So you'll never have a problem. But it's especially challenging when you're starting out or you're trying to rebuild a career or trying to engage in a new technology stack or something. Um, when I started teaching myself Objective-C about a year and a half ago, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know what I was doing. So I wanted to be competitive, and it, it helped. So it helps create more signal and less noise around you as a person. And the fact is that we all do this. We use Google as a significant signal to who we are as people. Whether it's right or wrong, it's, it's really not. I'm not trying to qualify that. But you've done this. You Google yourself, sometimes, maybe too much. Uh, you Google your peers, your colleagues, potential employers. And, and you know this to be true as well. They Google you. They look for you. They look for signals about who you are as a software engineer, but also the signals around your person, your character. Are you a person who gets high and drunk on Friday nights? And are they willing to risk to pay you despite those character flaws? And so for Google's sake, in many ways, again, not qualifying whether this is good or bad, but rather stating what is, you have to consider personal branding as a part of your strategy, if you will. And uh, again, not a super fan, but it really has accelerated a lot of my life. So the, the point then is you have to be a little bit different. You have to give Google and the other signals something to talk about, something to write home about. But the difference is you have to do it on purpose. The fact is all of us, um, especially if we have GitHub profiles, we have signals already. The question is, have you been intentional about those things? Have you actually created positive signals around your character, the work that you do, your passions as a developer, a particular angle? Maybe you love some scaffolding technology, and you're like, yeah. Is that a positive signal for an employer? And have you done it intentionally? And so the point is one of control. Be in the driver's seat, metaphorically. Again, it's not a question of if. If you have a personal brand or some signals around your name and your person, it's not a question of if, it is a question of how and how good and of what quality and how consistent. Does any of this make sense whatsoever? I do enjoy hearing myself talk. No. So, so you have an entire opportunity to be entirely epic. You may not have ever thought, hmm, I should really think about the signals that I'm creating out on the interwebs. But now is an opportunity to really start fresh, um, especially for our students and our cohorts um, in the Iron Yard. They have a very unique opportunity to make a major pivot in the software world. And they can start entirely fresh. That's why we require all of our students to blog, because a blog allows them to control from end to end the messaging around their new career. Excuse me. So if at one point they were a florist, 
or a Starbucks barista, which are real stories, they are now able to craft a message around this new brand. I'm a new junior level software engineer in Rails or Objective-C, and I'm looking for an opportunity. And strange things begin to happen. So social media, obviously. So the point around social media, I guess, is just to choose wisely. Um, I used to be a super fan of social media. Now I absolutely hate it. I don't have a Facebook page or a profile there. Um, I stick, keep an account because, I mean, how I mean, how many of our clients have asked us to create Facebook integrations? Like every single fucking one, right? So you have to have an account to create, you know, to use their API and stuff. And I'm very close to quitting Twitter too, but I'm working through that. The, the point is to choose wisely. So at one point I had tons, um, but there is something very special that happens when you choose one or two and you go really deep. Um, a couple of years ago, I made a decision to cut all ties to all major social networks except Twitter. And I would jump from like eight or nine, 10,000 followers on Twitter to over 100,000 within a few months. And it was an incredible experiment. I'm now hovering around 189, 190,000. And it would be an absolute lie if I didn't tell you that that makes an incredible difference. For not only for me, for my companies, for the portfolio companies that I oversee, one tweet from me allows them to enter into spaces that they may not have otherwise earned on their own right. And that's powerful. I'm not saying that I like that. <laughs> in fact, I really, I really don't like it. But it's an incredible tool in your digital tool belt, if you will, to, to leverage for your career. So choose wisely. If you actually Google me and you go to images, this is what you see. Now, after blogging for 13 years, I control generally the capital along like Google's indexing. And all of these images will land on a blog, which is what I'll get to a little bit later in this presentation. As you can see how powerful this is as a controlling tool for the message around who I am, what I'm doing, what I'm involved in, and the work and the stuff that I'd like for you to see. So you click any of these links, they'll go to my blog, which are one two, or two clicks away from the About page, which links to my properties, my investments, the work that I'm doing, the things that I'm you know, building, et cetera, et cetera. It's a straight channel of opportunity for me. It's taken, again, a long time, but it's powerful. So here's an introspective moment for you. If we were to do the same exact exercise, what would show up? And is that good? Now, I'm not here to answer that question, but I mentor high school students occasionally when people let me. And I mean, these kids are just dumb. <laughs> I mean, I just, I constantly tell them, you are making yourself unemployable. You know that, right? You're underage drinking. You know, it's not, not that smoking's a sin or anything bad, but that just looks tacky, right? Um, who cares if you're a straight A student? They're going to Google your ass. And it's just really, it's really sad. So I try to work with them on that. And they don't listen to me, but whatever. But the point is that Google is a powerful signal for employers and for contractors and for organizations. I know for everyone who's raised their hand, who's hiring, and certainly me who's looking to hire, I will Google you. And I will see some interesting things, which might explain why you get or don't get jobs. Who knows? I mean, who knows? So the idea then is you need to create some sort of base station, some operation of control to maximize the signals that you create for employers and stuff like that. Again, I figured this out by accident. I stumbled across this, this over consistent blogging. So I didn't, this wasn't, I didn't set out for this. And, and here I am standing before you as a badass. I, I lucked my way into this. So blogging is how I use my base station. I joined Twitter in 2008. I just told you that story. Um, and uh, have been lucky to, to gain a, a good following. And I, I leverage that as best as I can. I'm very intentional with that as well. Um, I'm not there to be your friend. I'm not there to have a private conversation. I'm certainly not there to date. I'm there for marketing. 
I'm there for message expansion. I'm unashamed about that intent. It's just the way it is. Although 90% of what I talk about is random shit, just like most of us. Uh, but if you were to look at my last company um, that I exited last, um, last year, we would tweet out very systematically and programmatically on Thursdays at 11. And we would tag those things and track those metrics. We were selling a digital product. Um, we just crossed a million in revenue. And Thursdays was our party day. We had about a quarter million followers globally as an organization. And we'd, we'd tweet that out. We'd track those and we'd sell tens of thousands of dollars worth of products. We would go get, then go to the local bar, get smashed, and see how much we earned over that hour period. That was awesome. And so I'm unashamed about it. Twitter is marketing. Uh, I don't know that, that the social stuff. There might be some social media gurus here. I'm sorry I'm offending you, but I don't believe that shit. All right. So then what's the magic sauce? What, what's the secret sauce outside of the absolute luck that I've had over the last 12, 13 years of doing this? And it's execution. There's nothing else. I don't care how many blogs you go to, HubSpot Marketing, Mashable, all those marketing blogs that tell you tips and tricks and whatever. The only thing that matters, and you know this especially as developers, is did you write that code or not? Did you execute against the requirements or not? And so the only thing that I have to suggest for you guys is to execute. If you're going to do this, do it. Don't just think about it, cogitate for a bit, and then you know, go to your next meetup. Actually go do it. Uh, that's a picture of my wedding band, which I have lost. Um, but that's not the message. The message is commitment. <laughs> uh, message is commitment that outside of execution, commit, uh, commitment to it matters. That executing once is not enough. Committing to it long term is everything. You know that, again, as developers. The only reason why uh, you've been successful in your, your career is you're exercising that development muscle. You're learning, you're going to meetups, you're going to the new intermediate meetup, which just sounds really badass. Plug. Um, you know, continue to exercise, just like uh, exercise. Need to remember that. And last tip, if anything, outside of execution um, commitment is um, make it personal. This is my daughter, We're teach I'm teaching her Rails right now, she's seven. Uh, this really cool video of her making her first uh, like, like making your first line and you know hitting enter and just her light eyes light up. She's like, oh my god, I'm a. Uh, she said, I'm a coder. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I captured that on video and I just probably one of the best videos. And then of course her her sister runs around the the, the edge of the wall and says, my foot, my foot. Um, but uh, seeing, you know, for for those who are old enough to remember. Basic, that's where I learned. Like you didn't have this responsiveness of being able to see something and then seeing this reaction, this this cycle, this feedback loop, if you will. Uh, kind of, you just kind of guessed and hoped it happened. Uh, but for her to see, to hit a command and then to see something happen on the screen is just, I never want that to get old. I, we live in a wild, wild world. So anyway, last, the third thing is just make it personal. You have to give a shit about what you're doing. Again, you know that. That's, that's fairly obvious. All right. If you do those three things, guaranteed kick ass. And you win the internet. All right, so on to the second part of this strange but something in presentation. I appreciate that awkward laugh. <laughs> All right, so. Now we've kind of worked through the why. If you haven't been convinced, maybe you're just so much of a badass that you don't need to. But for a lot of us, even the slightest execution against uh, blogging and branding will take you a long, long way. So now we'll go into the execution part, some of the practicalities of, of making this happen. You guys are smart, so we can go through this pretty fast. So why blogging? Talk about that, branding, et cetera, et cetera. The point, though, for me is that it accelerated everything. I'll be 32 this year, and I have done a shit ton of stuff. I've had a load of fun. I've made more money than I need to. 
but I'm just 32. And I just, I marvel at that. I never take that for granted. Um, I have a very distinct, I'm in touch with my mortality, if you will. I, I don't know when that happened, but I just knew when I was young, I'm going to fucking die soon. I better get this thing going. But blogging, again, helped me. It helped accelerate a lot of the stuff. And I'm not the most talented engineer. I Self-admittedly, I'm not that talented. I just stumbled upon the ability to communicate the work that I was doing so that people, mostly dumb people, but they chose me for opportunities instead of others. And maybe that's what you're missing. So I've been blogging for 13 years. There was one year I blogged 3,248 times in a calendar year. That's an average of nine, almost nine times a day. Uh, talk about obsession, but I still love it. And I blog at least once a day. Typically, it's about two times a day. And I make it, it's, it's a habit. It's a, it's a habitual thing. It's part of my process, if you will. But the point is, it accelerated everything in my life. And I'm very, very thankful for it. Blogging back then, though, was updating a static HTML file to a server. Uh, and then time stamping it in reverse chronological order. Like, you know, with horizontal rules flaming, of course. And crazy gifts, but I'll go gifts or now come back. All right, so why? Let me count the ways. So here are some things that blogging has actually done explicitly for me. It has helped me get partners. One of the partners of my previous company uh, was actually a commenter on my blog five years prior. And we've started a conversation in the comment layer. I thought he was a troll, so I blacklisted his IP. He somehow got around that. <laughs> and uh, anyway, long story short, I moved my wife and our kids into his basement to bootstrap that company. And that was awesome. So we went from blog commenter to partner and then an exit. It's helped me raise venture capital, not directly, but it has certainly helped me um, engage with people that I have no right of engaging with. Um, for those in the venture space, Brad Feld is a household name. He has commented on my blog, and we actually started our accelerator program of Iron Yard out of the Techstars network. So your typical acceleration, three months, 20 grand, percent equity, and then carry on the back. It has given me office space. This is wild. Uh, been, uh, investment company out of Australia and Hong Kong made their first purchase here in Atlanta, the old Riches building uh, next to uh, underground Atlanta, that strange place. And then they, just, they needed someone to literally be in the building. They Googled co-working Atlanta. And if you Google that, my blog will come up near the top. And I just had canvassed and written about all the co-working spots in Atlanta. So they literally contacted, cold contacted me and said, looks like you know what you're doing. What if you brought your company to our space, we'll give you 50 grand to build out the space, and we'll let you stay there for a year. I was like, let me think. <laughs> uh, so literally, office space, like awesome. We spent most of it on an epic 8-bit mural from a local artist. So we totally blew all that cash on something really stupid. Um, <laughs> I'm an editor for Wiley Publishers. Um, I don't recommend that because they pay like shit. But being an editor for the biggest technical publisher in the world does hold clout. And they contacted me because I had written about certain series on my blogs well enough that it looked like I actually knew what I was talking about. My last book was. Um, uh, servers for Dummies, you know those dummy series, those yellow and black books you see at Barnes & Noble? So I edited the latest web hosting for Dummies book. Um, I mean, all right, who cares? Uh, clients and jobs, obviously, um, tons of opportunities. And then freedom, I think, is the most important one. It really gave me, really gave me opportunity to say yes to the right jobs and no to the ones that were just plain lame. You know, especially if you're contracting, as many of you are, um, sometimes you just have to say yes to everything, especially if you're starting out. But blogging for me, at least you know, indirectly, gave me so many, such a large pipeline that I was able to create some judiciousness around the decisions that I was making. Like, eh, it's a cool gig, it's a cool project. No, I don't, I don't really need that one. I'm, I'm sure I'll get another solicitation. 
So freedom allowed me to have a little bit more rest around the work that I did. And Lord knows how many of you need a break. All right. <laughs> it's my favorite picture. Let's just sit there. All right. Oh, no, no, no. That one, dude, that one's legit. Um, I should have, that one's legit. I mean, so anyway, so it sounds all like mystically rain, rainbow, unicornish. So here are some excuses and myths you've probably conjured up if you've inter ever entertained about writing. I hope to dispel those in a few minutes or so and uh, encourage you to really, really knock it out. Three, three major excuses and myths, time, content, and readers. I don't have enough time. I don't know what to write about. No one's going to read my shit. Um, you don't have to raise your hand, but I know most of you have thought of that. <laughs> She's from Atlanta, right? <laughs> Sweet Brown. Ain't nobody got time for that. Bronchitis. God, I, I saw that video a thousand times. Um, so no time, no time. I'm telling you that 15 minutes a week is all you need. 15 minutes a week. So count all of those extra YouTube videos that you watch, how many times you spend on Reddit, you know, hacker news. I mean, let's, let's keep adding it. You can do 15 minutes a week. And that's just one post a day. I think that alone will make you stand apart. And just think about it. All things being equal, you as a developer among a laundry list of other developers, right? And your stack ranked against them as hiring managers come or whatever. And they Google all 10 of you and your competitors, except you've been writing consistently about Node.js or Scala or Redis or whatever. You know, whatever the flavor of the month is, whatever you're, you're just like jonesing on right now. You have a higher and more positive signal about the work that you do than your competitors. That's all it is. It's just one signal of many. Of course, you have to go in an interview and not look like you're hungover. <laughs> but it's a positive signal. And sometimes, that's all you need is that one entrance. Many of you know, if I could just get an interview, I can nail it every time if you don't get the interview. And so if we can get there, then you can close it. Schedule it. That's easy. You schedule a number of things in your life. Apply this to blogging. It takes time to build a habit. I know. For 13 years, it's still a struggle, but you have to look at it as an investment. So, Sweet Brown, you got time for this. All right, I get away with this because I'm Asian. <laughs> no content, what? So this, again, is another myth. You know, what do I write about? Well, you start with your experience. I'm just write about what you've done, which I know sounds Ego and maniacal, it is. You'll just have to get over that. Talk about your experience as a developer, the things that you like, don't like. Developers, especially talented ones, are highly opinionated. Um, full stop. <laughs> highly op opinionated people, and a lot of them are jerks. But that's great stuff because Aren't you attracted to people who have opinions? Like who, just look at your circle of friends. They're not bland people. They are people with opinions, maybe shared opinions, maybe opinions that you don't equally share, but that you like anyway. I don't know why we don't apply this to the hiring scenario, right? Why would I, why would I hire an unopinionated person, which is a boring person? I hire highly opinionated people who love what they do and are willing to duke it out when we come to a technology decision. I love that. I think that's cool. So you are opinionated. Why don't you just man up or woman up? Is that a phrase? I want to be gender neutral. Do it. Uh, and just share that opinion. You lose nothing. And again, stack rank against the rest of the you know, development field. You have an opinion, you have the courage, that really is it, the courage to share that opinion. That's attractive to a, to a hiring manager. That's attractive to people who want to hire you. Wow, geez, he really came off strong about, you know, Node is what I'm kind of geeking out on, kind of on the back burner. 
wow, that's cool. Like, he really likes his stuff. That's, I think I want to talk with that person, that gal. Code snippets, Google loves that stuff. I don't know why, but it makes sense. Copy and paste code, what you're working on. I mean, how long would it take you to say, hey, totally uh, got stuck on this line right here. You know, this object won't compile, but here it is. Fuck. Publish. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's 30 seconds and you're done. You're, you're good. You're good. You have published. You are a digital creator. You're badass. Um, and then images are so easy. I mean, it is so easy. I mean, as superficial as that might sound, it's attached to your name. It's content regardless. Take a picture of your workstation. Probably remove some of the garbage before you take the image. <laughs> but Man, that, that junk works. This has no relevance to the next slide. I just like it. <laughs> no readers. So that's the second myth. Here's the third myth. Oh, no one's going to read my stuff. Bullshit. Your coworkers will for sure. Because why? They don't know what it is, but they intuitively know. You just became more competitive. I want to know what my coworker is doing to advance their career. Why would they do that? I'm going to look at you sideways. It's going to be an awkward water cooler moment, but you can be like, just trying to up my game. <laughs> your peers, so you're not in the you know, typical work environment. Your peers will definitely take note. They'll say, whoa, whoa, whoa. I don't like Node. Why is he talking about Node? <laughs> Organizations obviously will take note as they look for you. And the internet is weird. That's probably why I have this. The internet is just a weird place. Uh, in terms of the blog, here's a great metaphor. It's kind of like a crack house. You know, there are multiple entry points. You walk in and you have no idea where they came from, but they're there. Um, so we'll just stop. That metaphor stops right there. But <laughs> the internet is like that, and just. You just have no idea who, who enters it. Just like some of the stories I shared about the free office space, I have no idea why they would do that. But when I to told my three partners, hey, we're moving downtown next to uh, the underground Atlanta in a 3,000 square foot facility for free, no one was like, yeah, I don't know about that. We're up in fucking like Duluth, man. <laughs> I was like, you know, it was whack. All right. so. I have completely demystified your three excuses or myths, and now you've accepted the challenge, right? So excuses no more. Here are some options for publishing. WordPress, Tumblr, Subtle, Medium.com, Jekyll, Octopress, the last two being developer-centric. I don't care. I'm not dogmatic about any of these. I like WordPress because I had built a business around that. But I am the last person to tell you which one to choose. Just choose one. Who cares? If you want to use GitHub pages, do that. That would be a great place. Except uh, traffic goes down by 30, almost 40% if you use GitHub pages. Unless you do a crazy rewrite on the URL. Bing! So just be careful about GitHub pages. Picard. Execute. So you have to commit. Commit, schedule, and then profit. Whatever that profit might be, it may be very soon. It may take a long time to create this online equity. I don't know. But if you start today and the rest of these people in this room do not, I guarantee a year from now, you will be in a very different place than the ones who did not. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was building this deck in the, like this afternoon, <laughs> like, and I was just giggling. My team was like, what's going on? I'm like, I don't memes. <laughs> all right, so finally, to, to cap this off, there's a large opportunity cost if you don't try this. There's a small personal cost. I just asked for 15 minutes for a week. You can do that. So large opportunity costs, small personal costs. I just don't see how many of you could argue with that. It could very well transform your future. 
give you options and opportunities that you may not have entertained before. And that's really exciting. It's exciting and also scary to think that there's some opportunities that are available to you that you're just not aware of. That's a, I could, I, ha, I struggle with like acute anxiety. Whew, I, I, if I sit on that too long, I, I have to go take my meds. And then you just don't know. I think there are stranger things that have happened um, with the internet. So, you know, take it for a spin. All right, I'm done. Your turn to ask some questions. Yeah, what's up, bro? Yeah, you um, who can be fooled so easily. Yeah, well, you know, um, so um, what's your um, take on spending time working on things like, say, your Stack Overflow profile or Core, <laughs> where you're kind of more interacting with the development community? Yeah, like that, that's a great question. Um, I would say take the same principle as I shared earlier is choose wisely. You know, some of you guys have some killer Stack Overflow profiles. Some of you have some amazing GitHub commits, like, you know, how many times in a row, right? Um, mine looks terrible because most of my stuff is proprietary, you know, private. So I, ca I can't use it as a positive signal for, and in my career I don't need it as well. But again, choose wisely where you're going to spend some time to really invest. And it does make a difference. You know, imagine curating, making a little bit more sexy those profiles, and it just looks so much more classy, right? Compared to someone who doesn't re is not really thinking proactively about those profiles, but choose wisely because you don't have infinite amount of time, and then try to go try to do it really well. Um, what are your opinions on uh, split profiles? Because, for instance, I currently do work in kind of two in work work in an actual industry, and then and, uh, it's still in IT, but then uh, I've also been working on some developing things on my own application. So I'm kind of curious. Yeah. You know, so one of them is kind of a web developer, Rails, Django, yeah. you know, personality, and the other one's kind of a corporate Oracle data warehousing architecture. So I kind of hate myself a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> My first job was with Perl, ASP, and Oracle. And yes, I hated myself too. Um, so this is just, again, my opinion. I just still, I don't know how to do split personalities. I, I am one person, uh, and it's, it's, it's too difficult for me to isolate and segregate myself. And I think I've just learned to be comfortable with that m mashup, if you will. And so whether I'm talking about my family or, you know, our portfolio or my, my company or, I mean, whatever, it just kind of jumbles there together. And I, I feel okay with people finding that stuff. Um, but it really is a functional decision because I don't have enough time like, to manage multiple accounts and, and try to create these alternate personas and talk about myself as a third person. Um, so I just have chosen, for me, um, to just, I've got one blog and that's the way I'm going to execute. But it also is a competitive advantage. You have different worlds which that you can combine. And I don't know how, but there's something very fascinating about people who bring very different perspectives into engineering. In fact, a lot of the staff um, that I've hired, um, even in my, my current company, come from liberal arts backgrounds. And man, they are just brilliant in ways that I am not. And I love that. And it gives them flavor, and it gives them depth. And we've got a Norse mythology, she speaks four languages gal who does Ruby for us. Um, and she's so fucking cool, you know? So, and then she speaks Gaelic or something. So I was driving her home the other day, I was like, or Irish, Irish Gaelic or something, some dialect, something, right? She's like, speak to me, like in that, whatever that is, <laughs> as we're stuck on 400. And it's just like, wow, you know? But she's an engineer, but she's interesting, right? You know, one of the things that we, we, we coach our investments and as they prepare for their pitch events, is we say the goal is not to convince. The goal is to be remembered. That's it. Because you're not going to make, they're not going to sign you the check there, right? After a couple beers, they might. But the goal is to get the follow-up. 
The goal is for you to remember it enough for them to say, out of the 20 pitches I saw tonight, that guy's a badass. I can't exactly remember what product it was. It was probably another photo sharing app, right? <laughs> <laughs> Just like mine, but, uh, but man, he was cool. He was memorable. I, we, should go, we should go hang out with him at happy hour. So in that way, I think, combining the distinct parts of who you are, your experience, your backgrounds, your experiences is very positive. I don't, I don't see that as a negative in any, any area um, whatsoever. Great question, though. The internet's kind of scary. You not think that it might. Well, let's just sit right there. The internet is scary. <laughs> oh, you have a question? <laughs> yeah, do you not think that it might backfire 10 years from now? Or is it just doesn't matter? Doesn't care? I mean, honestly, who knows? Uh, honestly, who knows? And, but, but the people in this room, I think, are talented enough to pivot and maneuver. Because we're the ones who are creating the fucking thing, you know? We are, the, we are engineering. It, it is a weird reality, and you may have never thought about it, but if you're a software engineer, you are literally changing the perspectives of millions of how they perceive technology and human interaction. It's a wild thing. If you sit on it too long, it gets really scary. Because you're changing the way that people are perceiving their engagement with inanimate objects and data. Have you ever thought about it? It's a wild thing. And there's a lot of money related there. That's why I think about that often. But you are, you are creating these realities for people. And that's, that's crazy. So I mean, who knows? So if it's broken, let's just, we'll just go fix it. You know? The answer is I don't know. Sorry. Good question, though. Or my daughter will fix it. I'll be like, hey, Rowan, you got to fix this. Like, your dad looks like a total ass. Um, this is going on YouTube, so she'll figure out a way to erase it. Yeah. So why would the traffic go down by 20 to 30% if you get help? There was, a, um, there was a Hacker News article about if you use GitHub pages, it's based on the page load. Because they use a, um, a spam system internally that has to route your DNS. A, a really complex system which elongates the time between the visitor and the actual page view. I'm overly simplifying that. But since page rank is based on speed as a major signal, you actually rank um, lower. Yeah. Uh, so you might as well push your Octopress blog to a Go to Weebly or Wix. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> but I love stock images. <laughs> so one workaround is to not use like an Apex, not host the beta site at the Apex right. of your right. like domain. So yeah. instead of like example.com, if you use www.example.com, that will work around. And the reasoning is just because you can't see name an Apex like a domain at the Apex, so you have to pin it to like one specific IP and that IP does feed off. Andy, stop making me look stupid. <laughs> it's a tough thing. If the DNS spec would ever allow yeah. C names as Apex, this would be a solved problem. But it doesn't. Like What's well, the funny thing is this, it's not actually a hard. The standard doesn't support it. Many implementations, including by do support it, though we still don't use it because it's not the standard. And there are, you can run into some issues. Whoa, fight! Especially with email. <laughs> <laughs> if you use a C name at the Apex and you like route mail, like that gets. Look at these guys, round one, Andy. I would not recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. You can Google it. So we can have a blog war now. Yeah! And that was like. Cool. Round one. <laughs> we got some. Finish him. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Do you ever uh, have anyone ghostwrite for you or do you have guest bloggers on your blog? Ooh. That's a great question. The answer is no. Uh, for my personal blog, no. I, I have had some guest authors, um, and it was noted that they were doing like a guest post or something. But vast majority over the is just my own thoughts. Yeah. Do you think that has a place in this in your in the, in the strategy? I guess I guess not. If you have any. No, because the the win 
of someone else writing content for you is actually a loss for me because it takes me more management time to copy and paste their really fucked up HTML into the system. I'm like, just, uh, I'll do it myself. You're diluting the brand. Yeah, that. What, yeah, whatever, yeah, I mean, yes. <laughs> I think so. Hey. Do you have a, I mean, I don't know, like a personal policy for deleting or editing previous blog posts? No, uh, I don't have a policy or a strategy. I leave all of them there. Because once they're there, like Google has indexed that to Kingdom Come. And Wayback Machine, ain't escaping Wayback Machine. Um, so, but here's, here's, I mean, here's the, the honest truth is we have all changed as individuals and matured as adults. So the things that we believe today are not the same things that we believed even a couple of years ago. And I think that's okay. I think we are oftentimes scared of our past. And some of us have some weird past. I mean, the reason I left Atlanta when I graduated tech is because I had too many girlfriends here. I mean, like, that was just weird. Uh, but now I'm back, and I don't know where they are. <laughs> anyway, TMI, weird. Asperger's right here, sorry. Uh, but I think that's okay. I think it just shows that you're human, that you change and you evolve. And how many times have you guys pivoted or looked back at some of the software that you built and you were like, oh, revolting. <laughs> <laughs> and there's this gag reflex and you're like, oh, God, don't see me. Yeah, I mean, that happens. I think that's cool. Can I answer a follow-up to her question? Sure, because I do blogging too. Um, on some of mine, if I look at the analytics and there's certain pages that are just like, yeah, they were a blog post some time, but it's a landing page. I mean, it's, it's like the number two entry on some keyword in Google. And so people, in, in those cases, I declare them in the category of being what I call on the blog a maintained post. And it's marked very clearly, like, and it will have a change history, like, okay, uh, the version changed, so we updated, I updated the example, and I'll do a log. And because even though it's a blog post, it's this living thing because people are hitting it, like sometimes hundreds per day. And it would be a disservice to have it be stale information. And so that's just look at your analytics and decide what's right. As long as you're clear, though, uh, you, you know, it's not like you're being editorially dishonest on your, on your blog. Yeah, time stamping it. That's a great tip. The number one blog post of all time on John.do, my personal blog, is, the, is a blog post titled uh, Top 10 Creative Notebooks. And I, so I carry around, as, as digital as I am, I think there's something very fundamental to, uh, to analog. And so I love, I love these things. I, all my ideas and notes and scribble scrabbles are there. And so I've experimented with creative notebooks over time. And so I wrote, hey, these are the top 10 like creative notebooks that I've ever used, including that and action method and a bunch of other weird stuff. It has tens of thousands of views a day. And it took me a while to figure this out, but then I ad added um, affiliate links to those. <laughs> and, and now it, it, I get a check from Amazon every month from that one blog post. It's fucking ridiculous. <laughs> and you know, my wife's like, so, so I just, I know because I got a text message on my device today. I ordered this portable boom box, right? Like who needs that? But from Amazon, so they, they send you a text message. So I'm like, oh, like, so I text message my wife, like, hey, there's this, this really strange, like, yellow and black package. It's, it's a portable stereo system. I don't really need one, but I think it would be cool. She's like, who paid for that? It's like, Amazon. Um, so Amazon allows us to have date nights and stuff like that, so that's kind of cool. Anyway, weird story. Yes? Um, so you were saying you kind of, uh that's wrong with the structure of like the way you do things with like your your notepad or whatever it is. Do you have you messed around or seen any advantages to the different structures of your site as it or your blog as it um, as it transitioned through the years? I, I used to spend a lot of time on the technical components. In fact I was um, uh, spent a lot of time in the WordPress world um, for 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 a number of years. And uh, my, the previous company I had, we were the fifth partner, Automatic. We, so we divided the company in half last year, sold half of it to WooThemes, which is one of the larger commercial players. 
and the other half to WP Engine, one of the largest commercial hosting providers for WordPress. So talk about being embedded in that universe. Um, but the only thing that I've learned that really keeps is the fact that I've published every day. And it almost doesn't matter at this point what the actual underlying structure is. You can make a very hard case that I should spend more time. But if there's anyone, I can speak with authority. Just publishing every day for the last 13 years, like I preempt most people's content, even if I'm writing the exact same thing. For those who are a little bit of a geek in terms of Google PageRank, I'm a, my blog's a PR5. As a personal blog, that's fucking ridiculous. And so I, I subvert a lot of spaces the moment I talk about something. And it's just because I have this arc as this trove of stuff. Most of it's crap, but you know, crap piles on each other and get higher. Um, so at this point in time, I don't spend any time on it. Dude, who could be convinced so easily? I have, I have one more question, because you're, you're told, you fooled me and convinced me, but um, <laughs> you see blogs like every day. Yes. Yeah. Do you try to have um, a more content-rich post that you periodically release in addition to things that are more throwaway bit? Yeah, at this point, I, I, there's no method to my madness. Sometimes it'll be 100 words and a picture of my kids and her broken leg. And sometimes it'll be a more thought, deep thought type post about leadership or my investments or whatever. I don't, I don't know. Um, so there's no, there's no method to the madness at this point. Yeah, sorry. It's getting hot. Our mind is hot. It's hot. Oh, shit. Do you, do you categorize your posts and like are there any kind of categories that tend to get more activity around them? Like I, I used to, but now I don't. I have I have four categories and that's just because WordPress demands one. I've got a, a legacy archive of 3000 that I wanted to kind of shuffle away. I have one on autism, that's kind of rare, and one on photos. So I have four. Do you see like more activity on in like no, there's no, there's no clear signals at this point. And if I could do away with all categories, I would. Um, you see those on the newer platforms like Subtle and Medium. Like, there's no category. Like, just doesn't really matter. Hey, thank you so much for your time and your attendance. I apologize for my ramblings, but thank you for ATL Rug for having me. And thanks so much. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL Rug Videos playlist.